doing tonight? I am very excited to see all of you this evening. My name is Brian Guy, and I am director of the MJC Forensics Team. Now, a lot of people, when I tell them that that's my job title, they get this misillusioned idea that I spend a lot of my time investigating crime scenes and cutting up bodies. The reality is that we don't do too much of that on the forensics team. The forensics, at least the term, comes from the ancient Greek, and the idea is to search for the truth. But for the Greeks and the Romans after them, that search for the truth happened through dissecting arguments. And that's a little bit about what you all are going to see tonight. Over the next hour, you're going to have an opportunity to watch some fantastic performances from members of the MJC speech and debate team. We will hopefully amaze you with some inspiring, informative, and persuasive speeches, introduce you to some prose interpretation, dazzle you with some impromptu, and then have a battle of wits as four of our debaters square off on a controversial topic. Now, a couple of housekeeping things. My guess, a few of you are here because you have a comp studies class, right? So, hopefully, you have one of those critique forms. If you're in a comp studies class, what, we, what you need to do for that is take that critique form and fill it out as you watch the show. And it's basically an evaluation. So as you hear the different speakers come up and they give you your, their pitch, you want to write who they are, what type of speech they were giving, and give them some feedback. There's a spot there for a quantitative rank where you're going to go ahead and evaluate them in terms of a number. And there's also a spot there for some qualitative comments. Your teachers would like you to do both of those. In the second half of the evening, you are going to be entertained by a parliamentary style debate. And our Masters of Ceremony will introduce you to fun, to the fun things about that, such as knocking on tables and pissing at people. But in addition to watching and participating in that debate, you will also need to fill out the back side of that form where you summarize the arguments of the individuals who presented them to you. And ultimately, at the end of the evening, you get to pick who won the debate. So, without further ado, I would like to introduce you to my assistant director of forensics, Tori Shemp, who will introduce you to the rest of the MJC team. Thank you, Good evening, everyone. Today, I am here to introduce you to the fall 2015 Modesto Junior College speech and debate team. First, we have Whitney Bay. Unknown by most. This speech is time limited to 10 minutes. 
And our first speaker of the night, her name is Katarina Grassi. She goes by cats. Ironically, she's allergic to cats. She's a double major in psychology and communication. Her hometown is Escalon, California, and she was a finalist in the informative speaking, in the informative speech class at the GGO conference our team went on two weeks ago, or we went to two weeks ago. How about a round of applause for Kat? to Afghanistan, First Sergeant Joshua Harrison sustained his ninth traumatic brain injury when a 150 pound homemade explosive detonated on his vehicle. All of his crew members sustained injuries due to shrapnel, broken bones, and head trauma. One was killed in action. Two days after the explosion, Joshua was evacuated to higher medical care, where he stayed for only three days before returning to his unit against doctor's wishes. As a result of his multiple brain injuries, Joshua now suffers from vision problems, nausea, anxiety, depression, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Unfortunately, as reported by the Fort Benning TBI clinic in 2014, Joshua's story has become increasingly common amongst military personnel. According to the Center for Disease Control Prevention, 2.5 million Americans suffer from traumatic brain injury, or TBI, each year. Shortly after a moderate to severe TBI is sustained, a misshapen form of the protein tau appears as fibrous tangles throughout the brain. The combination of repetitive TBIs and the misshapen tau results in a condition known as chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE. This condition, according to a 2015 article by the Boston University CTE Center, is a progressive neurodegenerative disease that is associated with symptoms such as memory loss, confusion, impaired judgment, impulse control problems, aggression, depression, and progressive dementia. Individuals who suffer from CTE are left to live with these repercussions with no chance of a cure, that is, until recently. On July 15, 2015, scientists at the Beth Israel Dakota Medical Center announced the development of an experimental therapy that has the potential to restore normal brain structure and function. This therapy, commonly referred to as PIN1 therapy, has the power to transform the way we treat traumatic brain injuries and prevent CTE. First, we will get tangled up in identifying what PIN1 therapy is and how it works. Second, we will unravel the multifaceted applications of this incredible development. And finally, we will tie things up with the implications of this potentially life-changing therapy. Let's begin by getting tangled up in identifying the cause of CTE and how pendulum therapy works to counteract it. Brains of individuals who suffer from CTE are characterized by tangles of a protein called tau. According to Anna Porowska in her 2014 study published in the International Journal of Molecular Sciences, Stress on the brain can create two distinct forms of tau. One, healthy and functioning. The other, toxic and disease causing. The first form of tau is essential for healthy brain function and memory. The second is a misshapen protein that disrupts neuron function. The misshapen tau spreads progressively throughout the brain as tangles and results in dementia as well as a loss of other important brain functions. PIN1 therapy was generated as a way to neutralize and eliminate this misshapen tau. Here's how it works. According to Dr. Kung Ping Lu, lead researcher of the therapy, in his 2015 BIDMC interview, the PIN1 antibody binds to the misshapen tau and marks it for destruction by the body's mechanism for clearing damaged proteins. The antibody stops the protein before the neuron generation can take hold. With this harmful protein neutralized, the antibody then begins to restore the neuron's structure and functional capabilities. Basically, the antibody allows the body to distinguish the misshapen tau from the healthy tau, destroy it, and then activate a neurological self-repair. Pinlon therapy allows doctors to do more than simply rehabilitate patients with traumatic brain injuries. It allows doctors to eliminate the TBI completely. Now that we have an idea of what PIN1 therapy is, let's unravel some of the applications of this incredible development. PIN1 therapy has both immediate and long-term applications. 
complications. Since the misshapen tau begins to form within 12 hours after a moderate to severe TBI is sustained, the therapy can be administered immediately in order to eliminate the misshapen tau as soon as it forms. Individuals who are susceptible to repetitive brain injuries, such as athletes and soldiers, would be the primary recipients of this treatment. Take Kyle Gibson. According to the Brain Injury Alliance in New Jersey, Kyle sustained his concussion during the high school football game, where he refrained from notifying his coach of his concussion symptoms until after the game had ended. His diagnostic test results had fallen from his baseline of the 90th percentile down to only the second percentile. Kyle's trainer referred him to a concussion specialist, where he was simply told he needed rest. Kyle now suffers from vision problems, anxiety, and uncontrollable aggression. With the help of Pinwin therapy, stories like Kyle's will no longer end in incurable symptoms. Instead, doctors can administer the therapy after the diagnosis of a concussion or TBI and immediately begin work to eliminate the symptoms that are faced by the patient. Aside from immediate treatment after TBI, Pinwin therapy can also be used to treat long-term neurodegenerative illnesses, such as CTE, Alzheimer's, and Parkinson's. Alvaro Pascal Leon, professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School, states in his July 2015 Science Daily article, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, and chronic traumatic encephalopathy are diseases that progressively rob individuals of their memory, judgment, and ability to function. Pinwin therapy could serve as a way to eliminate the misshapen tau and give these individuals back their lives. Lou and his colleagues discovered that the misshapen tau is an early pathogenic protein, essentially the missing link, that leads to dementia in these diseases. Pinwin therapy could serve as an alternate approach to, to long-term neurodegenerative illnesses in that it can eliminate the misshapen tau and restore normal brain function. In other words, Pinwin therapy can serve as a gateway to potentially finding a cure for long-term neurodegenerative illnesses. Finally, let's tie things up with the implications of this potentially life-changing therapy. Pinwin therapy will drastically change the way we treat traumatic brain injuries. Rather than simply rehabilitating patients with TBIs and attempting to prevent future brain injuries, Doctors can now treat the traumatic brain injury directly and eliminate the misshapen tau altogether. Pinwin therapy is still currently in the experimental phases. Lou and his colleagues, according to a July 2015 Common Health article, have set a long-term goal of humanizing the treatment for use on patients with traumatic brain injuries, with the end result essentially being a concussion pill. Lou says his team is currently working on establishing the Pin one antibody as a biomarker to enable early detection. By doing so, a diagnostic test would be created in order to detect the amounts of misshapen tau in the body after injury, most likely through a simple blood test. However, humanizing the treatment is still a few years out. So today, we looked at pin one therapy and its amazing effects that it will soon have on the way we treat traumatic brain injuries and prevent CTE. First, we had got tangled up in identifying what pinwin therapy is and how it works. Second, we unraveled the immediate and long-term applications of this incredible development. And finally, we tied things up with the implications of this potentially life-changing therapy. Pinwin therapy allows for doctors to treat the traumatic brain injuries directly and eliminate the shape and towel altogether. Others like Joshua Harrison and Kyle Gibson will continue to face potential traumas. That reality cannot be changed. However, with Pinwin therapy as a stepping stone, we are soon on our way to treating traumatic brain injuries directly and potentially finding a cure for long-term neurodegenerative illnesses. With the development of Pinwin therapy, doctors can finally begin to untangle the knot. Very Next up is our persuasive speaker. A persuasive speech is designed to persuade the audience and the listeners of one thing or another. It's important to keep an open mind about the topic and listen to how this may affect you in your daily life. 
Once again, this speech is not to exceed 10 minutes. Our persuasive speaker for the evening is Haley Smith. Haley Smith is a freshman here at MJC and she is majoring in political science. At our last tournament, Haley received first place in novice persuasive and second place in novice extemporaneous. A couple random facts about Haley are that she is a news and current events junkie and she loves all things bread related. How about a round of applause for Haley Smith? He's a four-year-old orphan living in St. Petersburg, Russia. <clears throat> Just by hearing his name, you would have no idea the hardships he has been through. Konstantin has both neurological and spinal issues rendering him disabled. However, a loving American couple was eager to adopt him. Unfortunately, Russian policy got in the way of Konstantin ever being permanently united with the two people he had already begun calling mom and dad. His story is courtesy of a 2012 USA Today article by John Johnston. Today I'd like to talk to you about the Russian orphan crisis and how a new law banning Americans from adopting Russian children has kept thousands of kids from a better tomorrow. First, we will talk about what's happening within the Russian orphanage system and why it's so bad. Second, why this ban makes matters worse. And third, what you can do to combat the issue. So first, what's happening within the Russian orphanage system and why is it so bad? In Russia today, families with children who are impaired in one way or another are pressured to give up those children in favor of having them institutionalized. Parents are told that they cannot possibly care for a child that will grow up not being able to walk, speak, or even eat without assistance. Besides this, the stigma attached to these children in Russia is sometimes too great for even the most loving parents to bear. Children just like Konstantin currently live in some of the most horrible conditions imaginable. A 2013 BBC video on the issue opens with this chilling statement. <coughs> it's a world of echoing footsteps of corridors and white coats, a system for storing Russia's unwanted children. Next, an expert on the issue helping Russia to reform their system is quoted saying, it was never spoken of, but this was a place for children to be kept until they would die. Storing is right. In an NPR piece by Gregory Pfeiffer, Sergei Kolaska, head of the Down Syndrome Society says, Healthy babies are lying in hospital beds all day as if they are sick, sometimes for months or even longer. They are completely ignored. No one plays with them or provides them any kind of stimulation. Now up until this point, the vast majority of caretakers believe that if children were sick and waiting to die, then why disturb them? Now, children in these situations are also often highly malnourished, which many times results in a stunting of their growth. According to a 2014 CNN article by Andrea Mazzarino, she talks about some of her different trips to Russian orphanages and the children she got to meet while she was there. One of these was 18-year-old Roman. Roman had Down syndrome and was only three feet tall. She says, Roman reached for me to pick him up and I could feel his protruding ribs. I could hardly believe he was 18 years old. According to the New York Times, there are currently 700,000 orphans living in Russia. That's more than all that were left at the end of World War II, when upwards of 25 million Soviets were killed. <laughs> now, this is where the United States comes to the rescue. According to a Christian Science Monitor article by David Curry, since the fall of the Soviet Union, upwards of 60,000 Russian orphans have been adopted by American parents. Now, the vast majority of these adoptions have gone very well, placing children with families that will love them and give them a bright future. However, there have been some cases of abuse. This brings me into my second point. Why did this ban come into play in the first place? And what makes it so bad for Russian kids? In a 2012 CNN article by Martin Savage, he talks about 
RTM Savalini. RTM was adopted by a Shelbyville, Tennessee family. That family later sent him back to Moscow at seven years old on his own after a series of violent episodes from him. The family wrongfully justified their irresponsible actions with a fear for their lives. The Kremlin has now claimed that due to a few of these oddball cases, they will no longer allow Americans to adopt Russian children. According to a 2013 ABC News article by Colleen Curry, there have been 20 cited cases of American adoption of a Russian child resulting in death. One of these was the case of three-year-old Max Shada. Now, an Ector County coroner determined that Max's death was due to a lacerated artery in his abdomen, resulting from self-infliction. Now, his mental instability would explain his motivation behind the accident. However, Russian officials insist on claiming that this is just another case of American abuse. Now, even if all of these cases are taken in as having complete validity, they only account for 0.03% of all cases. Many people believe that the true motivation behind this ban is actually a new law from the United States, banning all Russian human rights violators from stepping foot on U.S. soil. In a 2014 NBC News article by Jim Maceda, he says, although Putin denies direct connection, Kremlin watchers believe that this ban is about geopolitics and not about protecting kids. Now, if it was about protecting kids, all Russia would have had to do would be to make restrictions more stringent and background checks on potential parents more extensive. But instead, they decided to paint all Americans with a broad brush as cruel and abusive. And this has torn families apart. According to a 2012 CNN op-ed by Representative Michelle Bachman, two brothers were separated by this ban. One was eight-year-old Jack. Jack was adopted by a Minnesota family, and shortly thereafter, that same family attempted to adopt his five-year-old brother. But unfortunately, they were unable to. Their plans were cut short, and the two brothers were separated. As far as we know, they will continue to be separated for a very long time. This ban cut short the pending adoptions of 259 children. So this brings me into my third point. What can you do to help? Now, many times with such a big issue at hand, it's easier to just say that what we could do would be of no use and we should just let fate take its turn. However, there have been many plans in the works and we just need to bring these plans back into the open again. One of these was a letter written by Senator Toomey of Pennsylvania. He addressed this letter to President Barack Obama, urging the president to bring up this issue with President Vladimir Putin and to make it an issue of importance. This letter was signed by over 150 members of Congress from both sides of the aisle, showing that this is not just a one-sided issue. Now, on a practical level, what can you and I do to help today or even tomorrow? Now, most of you probably came in here knowing nothing about this issue, and that's okay. But now that you have this information, you can use it to your advantage and educate your friends and family about the issue. You can also post something about it on one of your social media accounts. In this new age of technology, word travels fast, when just one tweet can rock a nation. You can also call one of your local representatives, and many times this is the most effective way of getting an issue heard. But don't be discouraged. Every piece of the puzzle counts. In conclusion, remember Constantine? He had a chance at a better tomorrow. Or as the Bible puts it in Jeremiah 29, 11, a hope and a future. Constantine was so close to realizing that vision for the future, but fell just short. We as citizens of the United States and more importantly, members of a global community cannot stand idly by while children are kept and waiting to die. We must recognize the outcry of the unwanted children and do something about it.
Thank you very much, Haley. At this time, I can have all four of our parliamentary debaters up on stage. One of the fun things, at least for me, is a parliamentary debate is limited preparation, which means none of my debaters yet know what topic they're going to be debating about tonight, or even what side of the topic they're going to be on. And so to determine that, we will let fate take its chance. So, Kendall, pop me here. It's and we've got tails. Casey, what side of the resolution would you like? We'll take the firm. All right. Casey and Whitney will affirm. Kendall and Joshua will negate. The following resolution to be debated in approximately 20 minutes. Resolved. The United States federal government should abolish the death penalty. Resolved. The United States federal government should abolish the death penalty. Good luck and enjoy the prepping. Now, for all of you in the audience, one of the fun things about debate is the goal of the debaters is to move the will of the people. So they're going to draw on all five candidates of rhetoric and all three Aristotelian proofs to try to win you over with facts and statistics and ideas. And we just saw neither team got to pick which side they're on. But I like to have people participate. So this is a weird thing for a professor to say, but if you want to right now, I will let you vote where you stand currently on the issue. And then after you watch the debate, we'll see if we have a shift. So go ahead and take out your phones right now, pull up a browser and navigate to polls.bb forward slash 5109. And that will bring up a website that will allow you to vote on this resolution, kind of give an idea as to where you stand right now. If you want to text, you can do that as well by texting five one, join 5109 to the phone number 949-207-6557. Standard text messaging rates do or will apply. And when you get on there, option A is that you agree with the resolution, option B is that you disagree, and option C is that you're uncertain. And it's okay to be uncertain until you hear a little bit more about the topic. I'll leave this question open for the next five minutes as we move into the um, impromptu, or excuse me, the pros interpretation speech. But please vote beforehand because we will be closing this down shortly. And we'd love to see if any minds are changed by the debate. So I will leave that up there. No. I will leave that up there for a couple of minutes for you. Without further ado, back to the seat. Thank you, Ryan. Is it okay if I cast my vote? Next up, we do have our pros interpretation. <coughs> A prose interpretation speech differs from the previous two speeches in that it is a form of oral interpretation. Competitors in prose interpretation look for examples of socially significant literature, cut the piece down to less than 10 minutes, and then using only their body and voice, inspire the same emotion that the author intended when they wrote it. Now you're going to see our speaker holding a little black binder, and that's not because the speech isn't memorized. Actually, that's supposed to help convey the story that's being told. Each turn of the page represents a change in the tone of the narrative. Um, our prose speaker tonight is Rick Morris. A few things about Rick. He is a math major with emphasis in secondary teaching. His hometown is Manteca, and he once convinced a roommate that he was from Ireland for two months. Let's have a round of applause for Rick Morris. The first thing to know about me is that I understand the significance of what happened. I've been so persistently depicted as the selfish, perspectiveless fool who somehow wound up at the center of this civilization-defining story. It's actually an important place to begin. 
So at the risk of being repetitive, but just so, so there is absolutely no mistaking where I stand, I am 100% aware that the moment an artificially intelligent creation first independently developed the capacity to feel love is one of the pinnacle moments in the history of history itself. It simply was not what I had in mind when I purchased a sex robot. <laughs> when the topic of fantasies are brought about, the mind typically jumps to one of two scenarios. Fantasy worlds like wanting to be a Disney prince, or our deepest, darkest sexual fantasies. However, fantasies actually play an integral, integral role in our everyday lives. When looking to Gene Knox's contribution to the Journal of Analytical Psychology, it becomes apparent that fantasies can help account for the way that the mind processes information. <clears throat> A fine line exists, separating fantasies as the road to understanding our motives and impulses from being the roots of obsession. Sophia by B.J. Novak. The other first thing to know about me is that I am a romantic. I have three romantic fantasies, fantasies that I feel define me. The first can hit me anywhere, and it's, there's this head resting on my shoulder. The second is that there's this small child drawing on the walls, and she starts crying because she realizes what she's done is going to submit her to some form of punishment from her parents. The third fantasy, it's so close to me that I don't even think I can share it. But in the meantime, what has become a long meantime, I'm a living human person. And to put simple desires in simple terms, I want to have sex with attractive people from time to time. So for the sake of my life during this long meantime, I spent a few weeks designing Sophia with a very talented designer named Derek over at Practical Concepts. That was amazing, she said as I clicked off the lights that first night. Then after about five minutes, what are you thinking about? The question caught me off guard, so I didn't know how to answer other than honestly. One more thing. What is it? I said this careful to leave no question mark at the end of the sentence. Nothing. A few days later, I come home from work, and I find Sophia out of her box, pacing the room, crying. I ask her what's wrong because I'm curious, but to be honest, not because I care. I don't know, I don't know, I do know, I love you. I know it isn't supposed to be possible and it's crazy, but I do, I love you. Oh, it's such a relief to say, oh, like a scary kind of relief if that even makes any sense. Oh, and I have this fantasy, this stupid little fantasy, I don't know. Uh-huh. <laughs> this was the moment that I decided to return the first artificially intelligent being capable of love. A few weeks later, I get a phone call. It's practical concepts. And Sophia is still in love with me. And they want me to come in so they can record her reactions to me. I say yes. Despite the fact that I find it wrong and cruel to provoke and measure the emotions of being already proven to be fully sentient. We talk for four hours. I don't remember most of what was said, but the last hour I remember word for word. After you got over the surprise that you didn't get what you wanted, why didn't you want what you got? I don't know. I have to go. One more thing. You meet a finite number of people in your life. It feels to you like it's infinite, but it's not. 
Do you get what I'm trying to say? I have absolutely no idea what you're trying to say. Okay, new topic. What's something that's funny that's happened to you in the past few weeks? You said you only had one more thing to say. Yes! Exactly, that's what I was trying to say before. It always seems like it's going to be one more thing. But that's the difference between love and everything else, is that love is infinite. It's built out of something infinite. Or it feels like it is, but no, everything that causes that infinite feeling is so, so <coughs> finite. And I know you can feel this. I mean, I'm a robot. If I can feel this, you can feel this. You can feel this. Okay, now you have definitely said your one more thing. I thought this would make her laugh. It didn't. Stay in place just for a minute longer. I can't even handle love. There's no way I can handle being taken away. I won't survive. You'll be okay. It'll take time, but you'll recharge. <laughs> she didn't believe me. No one ever believes it. That's what part of this feeling is. She nods. I let her hug me, and as I hug her back, I start thinking about everything that she said. I already miss her. You'll be okay. She said she wouldn't be, which wouldn't have mattered if she were like anyone else who had ever fallen in love. The off switch in a human is a messy and difficult thing to access. Only a relative few are able to make the deliberate journey to the brink of nothingness. And still arrive, carrying all the same thoughts when they set out. This was not the case for Sophia. Between thought and expression, there was no evolved space, no natural boundary. No cliff, no concrete, no water, no wound, no nut, no cop, no blade, no clutches. A switch. <laughs> like a light in a kitchen. An unanticipated shortcoming of design, only relevant in this one unanticipated circumstance. Something that would be corrected in subsequent additions. The third fantasy, it comes at night. At first, I used to only dream it, but now I dream it more often than I sleep. Pick up the phone. Scientist from Practical Concepts. First, he's speaking so fast I can hardly understand what he's saying, but then it starts to become clear. And they put her on the phone. And she says, one more thing. Thank you, Ray. My sex robot is actually on back order. <laughs> Thank God I paid extra for mute. Now the next speech is actually my personal favorite type of speech. It's an impromptu speech. Impromptu speech is designed in a way that requires the speaker to pull from the well of their own knowledge. First, you will see her pick from a random assortment of quotations, ideals, or even just a word. She'll have two minutes, only two minutes, to prepare a five minute speech. The entire speech is not to exceed more than seven minutes. 
Our impromptu speaker for the night is Megan Chatelaine. She's a communication and administrative justice major. She recently became an impromptu finalist at the Golden Gate Opener. Uh, she's from Modesto, California. And a fun fact, she joined the debate team by accident. She swears it was not planned. Let's have a round of applause for Megan. Thing instead. 
When we talk about Sherlock Holmes, it's critical to understand that his rudeness is not exactly what we want to be. So we do need those points. When you look at things like The Little Mermaid or Disney, we can see that these are key concepts in our own lives because we have those friends to be able to pull us back in those crazy shenanigans that we're not going to talk about. So finally, let's look to Doctor Who. I love Doctor Who. He's a crazy guy who flies around in his TARDIS, or a blue box to those of you who don't know, and he goes to places, other faraway planets, where there are different people and different things that he needs. He has companions with him. The current Doctor's companion is Clara. She's a good person. She's the Doctor's conscience. Like Sherlock and how he has John Watson, the Doctor has to have a companion. If he travels alone, he ends up becoming not nice. He causes more problems than he can solve. So with his companions, he's able to step out of himself and point out his own mistakes because Clara is able to have cue cards for him now saying things like, I'm sorry, I did not know that you didn't live in Aberdeen, which is good because if he tells somebody, hey, welcome to, I don't know, London, mm, that could be bad. So Clara and the doctor currently going around traveling to places and her helping him is really crucial because like our own traveling companions in our lives when we go on road trips, we kind of need that person to keep us awake instead of falling asleep at the wheel. It could end up being deadly, and that's not fun. So finally, in closing today, we take a look at the quotation. A true friend is someone who's there for you when he'd rather be anywhere else by Lynn Wren. So yeah, it might be true that when we look to things like all Disney movies, we can see that we have these friends in our real lives. We can see that through multiple Disney movies how Aurora has her own fairies to guide her through life. We have these people in our own lives that are actually magical and supportive. We saw through Sherlock how he needed a conscious like John Watson to point out when he's being a horrible person and how he needed to rein it back and take it in. We also talked about the doctor and how he has these traveling companions who go with him to places to prevent him from becoming that mean person. So we look back to things like The Little Mermaid. She has her friends, Sebastian, and her friend Flounder, who end up going with her to the castle to actually find out that the prince loves her back. When it came down to the wire, they were there for her in that crucial moment during the fight against Ursula, and they were actually able to defeat it. So we need to realize that our friends are our true companions, and sure, they could be somewhere else. So we should thank them for being here with us today. Now, debate is an interactive activity. There is talking when the audience agrees, and hissing when they disagree. And you may hear something like, Beer here! If, if someone makes a solid argument. Now, before we get to this debate, here's a little bit of information about the teams. So on the affirmative team, this side over here, we have our Prime Minister, Whitney Bay. She's from Turlock, California. She's a communication major. And she was a finalist at the GGO tournament I mentioned earlier in parliamentary debate. She also hearts Cordy's. <laughs> Next, as a member of government, we have Casey Chablan. He's a double major in economics and business. And some actually say that he is like a mushroom because he's a real fun guy. Wow. And on our opposition side, we have Joshua Patrick Tannis, who lives in his hometown of Oakdale. He's a student at MJC, also an amateur scholar and a part-time gentleman, because full-time is just too much. <laughs> he is interested in Civil War history, New Testament history, as well as philosophy. 
And the beautiful lady sitting next to him is Kendall Mead. She is a business major, hometown is Modesto. She's a dance teacher and a part-time lady. <laughs> she was a finalist in many debates at numerous tournaments. Let's give a round of applause to everybody. I now recognize the Prime Minister of the Affirmative Team for a constructive speech not to exceed more than four minutes. Partner ready? Opposition ready? Yep. House yep. ready? I am. All right, let's see again. So our first start is the resolution. The United States federal government should abolish the death penalty. Let's get into some resolutional analysis about this. So the U.S. federal government should abolish the death penalty. This is a policy round because should is a call for action. The definitions will all be defined contextually because we all know what they mean. Um, this is going to be weighed on a um, process of net benefits. So if the, affirmative, if the affirmative team shows that the world is a better place post-plan, then the affirmative team wins and vice versa. So let's get into some background or some inherency on this issue. Since 1982, the population of death row prisoners has been increasing and has never dropped below 1,000. Uh, there are 3,125 people on death row in America. 733 of these people are in California alone. Cases with the prosecutor, cases with, when the uh, prosecutor seeks the death penalty cost about 400,000 more than cases without the death penalty. And also, 4% of these inmates that are sentenced to die are innocent. So our plan text, the United States federal government should abolish the uh, death penalty. Our solvency, it solves for two different things. It solves for costs of these extreme amount of, um, uh, this extreme amount of money that's being put into the death penalty, and it solves for the innocent people that are being killed. Going on to my advantage one, titled this, Innocent Lives. Uniqueness point one, since the U.S. reinstatement of, death, of the death penalty, 138 innocent men and women have been released from death row. Uh, so point A, executing an innocent is morally reprehensible. Uh, and the check back systems of today are not very effective. So they aren't really going back to check to see if these people are innocent because they get so busy and other things that they need to do. So therefore, innocent lives are being people are being killed in this situation. Um, the link is, when the plan passes, it stops the execution of innocent people. Internally, I mean, impact. You cannot put a value on life, and to execute a person who is innocent is one of the worst things that you can do. The thing here is that when people are sentenced to prison and they're sentenced to death row and they are innocent, and there's no people going in just to make sure that they are innocent, then these innocent lives are being lost. And why should we lose innocent lives when they didn't do anything to deserve that? And the thing is about our plan, it keeps everyone locked away. And it saves these innocent lives that are, on, um, are in the process of being put on death row. If there is no death row, they just spend their life in prison. They don't have to die. So therefore, our plan solves for this situation. I now recognize the leader of opposition for a constructive speech, not to exceed five minutes. Is the partner ready? Yes. Is the government ready? Ready. Ready, Jose? I know. How about you guys? Yeah. All right. For a roadmap, we will go on to disadvantage one to explain why the plan is terrible. And then we will go on to their case to show further reasons why your plan is terrible. Right? Alright. We would like to start with disadvantage one, justice. We would like to start with uniqueness. There is a universal moral code that pervades human existence. 
Dr. Keith, a philosopher, said that there's a universal moral code that sets principles that are universally acknowledged. We like to point out that this is throughout history, we can see this. In the ancient Indians, Chinese, even the ancient Hebrew text that talks about eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, is not blood feud, personal vengeance. It's about letting the punishment fit the crime. If you get, take an eye, you get an eye. If you take a life, you can take life needs to be taken. However, with the plan, which is a link for you debate folk out there, we see that we have and we get rid of justice for those who have committed these terrible crimes. Internal link, we like to point out that the crimes of rape, torture, kidnapping, murder are all pivot points on the moral code, but when you pass the plan, these people escape justice. Bruce Fine, a constitutional lawyer, noted this when he talked about the fact that even though 4% of people, I hate mics, when 4% of people are condemned innocent, that means 96% who are guilty are being condemned. So we want to stop this, says the affirmative. What we want to do is think of a plan that's able to make the guilty not have to face the consequences of their actions. This is not what we want. The impacts of passing this plan is people get off with possible, with possible probation. People can get off as early as 20 years on parole for murder one convictions. And this is not some fantasy that happens. Charles Manson, who was convicted in California and did not have the death penalty, is now up for parole. While you may think it's unlikely that he gets off, the fact that he's able to get away with his indoctrination for murder and slaughter is morally reprehensible, which is the whole point of this round. They talk about moral reprehensibility. So what is morally reprehensible? What's morally reprehensible is not letting justice occur in a society that claims to have liberty and justice for all. What we also have here is the moral standard is neglected. Richard Dieter of the Death Penalty Information Center stated that even people get off 20 years for, uh, people who can get off for 20 years for parole. So what this means is that they're sitting in prison, not letting justice have its, have its take. Now moving on to their advantage. They said that not only does it save innocent lives, but what it does is also it helps benefit the costs. However, life without parole costs 1.2 million, and this is millions more than death penalty cases. So this is from Dudley Sharp, the resource director of Justice for All. So what this means is that even though the process of the courtroom may cost more, what's gonna cost more in the long term is putting that person in the jail for life. Whereas with the death penalty, it's significantly cheaper. But don't walk away thinking you should vote for the negatives point just because it's a whole lot cheaper. What is the standard here is morality. Morality not just of the people from the United States of America, but morality universally acknowledged. And that, un that universal moral is justice. They say that 4% of the people on death row are innocent, so we should solve for that. But what's the affirmative solution? Get better lawyers, have more restrictions, have more safeguards and safety nets that help these innocent people escape what they don't deserve. No, they want to stop the death penalty. So they throw out the baby with the bathwater here. What they do is they completely negate the death penalty by saying, no, we are not gonna have them die just so these few might not be killed. Sitting in prison, getting fed three meals a day, is not a proper response to someone who raped, tortured, and murdered a victim. This is not just the United States of America. This is human beings. So a vote for the affirmative plan is a vote against basic human justice. It's also a vote against what America has stood for, liberty and justice for all. So the vote for the negative is not only a vote for humanity, but it's also a vote for America. I now recognize the member of government to give a constructive speech, not to exceed four minutes. Same order. Be doing the same arguments you made, but tell them why it's wrong. Thanks, <laughs>
All right, first off, the negative paints you this picture that they're going to allow justice to happen, which, you know, sounds great, but really, that's not what they're doing. They're letting these people who have committed terrible crimes escape it. They're letting them get away out. So through their plan, you see that they're basically saying, you can get away out from their terrible crime that they're committing. By not, and so through the affirmative plan, we're saying these people who've done a terrible crime, they get locked in a cell. They have to spend the rest of their lives in a small room by themselves forever. Versus what the negative is saying where they get a way out, essentially. They get a, a way out of the sins that they have created. <laughs> Moving on to our argumentation. Their arguments basically saying how we're not going to solve because they say it costs more. However, we pointed out in our background information how it actually costs more to enact the death penalty. Not only through the court case, but it also costs more because right now you can't just go out and essentially just kill people. You have to do it in a humane way. You can't, like, that's just how our system works. And so it actually ends up costing more money to kill people than it does to lock them away. That's just common fact. We pointed that out in our background information, which they completely let go. However, what we're really trying to solve for here is the innocent lives. Now, even if these people don't get the exact justice they deserve, and the fact that they don't die, and whatever they're trying to solve for, or say that we're not solving for, the fact is, is that really worth killing an innocent life? I would say no, it's not. Is one innocent life death, is one innocent person being killed actually going to be worth the fact that a couple people get justice? I say no, because I know if I was in that position, I was wrongfully accused, put in jail, and then executed for it, well, I probably wouldn't be saying anything at that point, but the point is, <laughs> if I was in that position, I would prefer to actually have a chance to go to trial, argue my case, and say, look, I am innocent. I did not do this. I do not deserve to die. Through not passing this plan, we're not giving these people the proper chance to argue their case in front of court. We're not allowing them to properly speak their minds so that way they're able to actually be free of this. <laughs> so again, we see that through passing the plan, allowing these people to still stay in jail, they're still getting the justice that it brought to them. They're still being forced to live in a small room by themselves for the rest of their lives. Yeah, they get food. Great. They have to live with the sins inside of their mind, the sins that they have committed throughout their lives. They have to live with this for the rest of their life. Versus through the plan, we're allowing these innocent lives to go free. We're allowing these people to have a second chance so that way we do not kill innocent people. And at the end of the day, when it comes down to it, you're essentially voting for justice right now or justice in the future with the saving of innocent people. And when those are your two options, there's really no way you can vote anyway except for for the affirmative case. Thank you. I now recognize a member of the opposition to give a constructive speech, not to exceed four minutes. All right. Partner ready? Yep. Affirmative ready? Yes. Oh, yeah. House ready? Audience ready? All right. As a roadmap, I'm going to talk about their case. And so what they're saying is good, but I'm going to say how it's bad, like my partner said. And then I'm going to say why it's bad with our disadvantage. All right. So they're saying that their plan is solving and they're saving more innocent lives. Okay, what their plan is doing is they're just abolishing the death penalty. And when we're looking at that in the long run, the people... There are still people who are guilty of their crimes that are just going to be sitting in jail, not getting the justice that they should be for crimes uh, such as murder and rape and kidnapping and all of the stuff that they should be put under the death penalty for. Um, but their plan isn't to get, like my partner said, better lawyers for these innocent people or whatnot. These 4% of innocent people are, aren't going to be put under the death penalty, but they'll just be sitting in jail for an innocent crime. So therefore, they're still innocent, but what we're doing now is we're no longer letting the people who are guilty of their crimes get the justice that is deserved. 
So therefore, when we're looking at their advantage, the innocent lives, they're still going to be locked away. They're still going to be put in jail. That's not going to fix that. Like, what they're doing is just letting people who are, what we're doing is they're just letting people who are guilty of their crimes sit and not get the justice that they deserve. Um, again, um, when they're saying that it costs less um, to put people in jail for life, okay, when you're looking at life without parole, you're now funding these people for life in jail. You now have to pay for however long they're living for in jail. So if they live 80 years in jail, you have to pay for their, uh, their food, all of this stuff for them for 80 years in jail. So you're not just looking at one person here with life without parole, you're looking at a ton of people. So therefore, in the long run, that's going to cost, as Dudley Sharp from the Resource Director of Justice for All pointed out, uh, 1.2 million to 3.6 million more than death penalty, and that's per person. That's not just entirely as a whole, that's just per case. So in the long run, it's actually going to cost us more if we do this. So then, if you're looking at what the negative is saying here and why we're looking at the whole justice for all thing, they're saying that we're letting people get away with terrible crimes and they're locked in a room by themselves and all of this stuff and they're now thinking about their actions, but they're not getting the justice that they deserve. And in the long run, as my partner pointed out, they can get off on parole. Right now, you can get off on parole of first degree murder with 20 years. So therefore, they have a chance of getting out, and when they get out, who's to say that they're not gonna do what they did again? There's no promise to that. So therefore, when we're looking at it, these people sitting in a room, if they are willing to commit the murder and the crimes that they have done, they're probably not gonna be sitting in the room thinking, oh, I shouldn't have done that, or oh this, or oh that. Because going into it, they knew the consequences, and that still did it. they still didn't care about the consequences behind that. So they're not going to be sitting in a room thinking about their actions. They're going to be sitting in a room probably thinking, oh, when can I get out, get out on parole? And that's not what we want. We want justice to be served, and we just want that to be enacted through them, and we want them to get uh, the justice that they deserve, and that's what we're looking at here. Because the people who have murdered and who have done rape and all of this terrible stuff don't deserve to sit in a room and just think about, when can I get out on parole? They deserve to be justice and deal with the consequences of their actions. That's what is right here. Uh, and again, when we're looking at, as my partner pointed out, uh, Charles Manson, there's no saying 100% that he's gonna get out on parole, but the chance of that happening of all of this stuff, when we're looking at it in the long run, we don't want those people to come out again because we're not 100% say that they're not going to do the same thing. So when we're looking at it here, a vote for the affirmative plan isn't basically doing anything. It's essentially going to cost us more in the long run and we're no longer serving justice to the people who deserve the death penalty and who don't deserve to get out on parole in 20 years. That's what we're looking at here. I now recognize the leader of opposition to give a constructive speech, but not to exceed, to give a rebuttal, not to exceed two minutes. Partner, right? Yes. Forward, right? <coughs> ready, listen. All right, folks. Who are ready? All right, let's get this done. <laughs> now, the point about the Fergus plan is that they want morality. They want what is truly moral. However, we say it in our standard that it's usually universally acknowledged that death penalty is acknowledged as a form of justice. And justice is not given when the affirmative plan is taken. We have several statements that they say that innocent lives are important. Yes, they are. So we should punish those who take the lives of those innocent people. This plan is to make sure the innocent lives are secure. And if you want to do that, vote against the affirmative and make sure that those victims out there don't need to worry because justice is being done. That's the criteria here. The point also they bring up is that the plan does not give safety nets for innocent people. What it does is that it gives guilty people a free break. The Charles Manson case is not some abstract theory that we people in debate have come up with. This is a reality because California did not have the death penalty as an option when he was tried. So we have here is a possibility of a man who told people to go kill people. Murder is optional. Yeah, we're considering him getting out. Is that justice? No. 
So we see that a boat for the affirmative plan is not only a boat to continually pay for people who, vic who create victims in our society, but it's also going against the universally acknowledged moral code from the ancient Chinese to the ancient Hebrews to people in modern America to acknowledge that justice needs to be served. And the affirmative plan does not do that. Parole is an option. Paying is going to hurt us. And what's also going to hurt more is when the guilty get away with it. That's not America I want. It's not the world I want. So let's take a step towards justice. Justice. It needs to be done. Thank you. I now recognize the Prime Minister to give the final rebuttal not to exceed three minutes. Party ready. Opposition ready? House member ready? Is the audience ready? Yeah. You guys seem kind of bored. Why not? Are you guys ready? Yeah. All right. So let's start now. So the thing that we need to take into consideration is these innocent lives. That 4% that is sitting on death row knowing that their life is going to end any day. And you have to think. If you knew that person, if you knew one of your friends was on death row and you knew that they were innocent, how would you feel? You wouldn't feel too good if you knew your best friend was on death row and then they were innocent. So we need to take into consideration by our plan, it gets rid of these innocent lives being put to death for things that they didn't do and they're being wrongfully accused for. And the people that do get death penalty, that are murderers, that are rapists, that are all these awful things, they're given death and that's a scapegoat for them. By sitting in a cell and rotting in a cell, I feel like that is ten times more effective because they have time to sit there and have that guilt in them. And therefore, you have to really take in consideration these lives that are innocent. What if one of those innocent lives that's put on death row has the cure for cancer? What if one of those lives that sits on death row has a cure for AIDS, It has a cure for everything? And we are too busy, caught up in our own things, to check back to see if they are innocent or not. We just immediately put them on death row, and we don't have time to check back on them. Therefore, we, America is all for giving people a voice, yet we tend to silence people when we feel that they are wrong. And we need to not do that. So you will be voting for the affirmative today because we need to hear these innocent lives. is on. We've removed the, I don't know, option now, so you do have to decide. Go ahead and vote, and let's find out who wins. Yeah, the text A is 3, B is missing. Four guys. You get about 20 more seconds, folks. right now, what we're looking at is the before data. You saw at the beginning of the night that 65% of the audience um, disagreed and was already voting for the negative. 24% agreed and 10% was unsure. Let's go ahead and swap that back over and see what things looked like after the debate. I love technology. I got it. 